Hi everyone, thank you for watching and welcome to our latest Artemis Live video interview. Um, today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Pete Daly, Head of Research, and Frank Fisher, Partner and Chief Analytics Officer, both, both from ELIS Capital Management. Now, ELIS is a specialist reinsurance and retrocession investment fund manager that targets largely property catastrophe exposure. As a result, climate risk and climate change are key considerations and, as we all know, topics of intense discussion among the ILS investor community at this time. So I wanted to explore how ELIS is leveraging climate modelling data and analytics to inform its portfolio construction and management, and also ask Pete and Frank how they see the use of climate inputs to ILS decision making evolving over time. So welcome both of you. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks, Steve. So to begin, perhaps Pete, I'm going to turn to you and maybe you could give us a bit of an overview of how climate models work and explain for our viewers how they help us to understand climate change. Yeah, sure. Um, so climate models are what we call 4D gridded representations of the global environment. When I say 4D, four dimensional, I'm referring to the three dimensions of space and the dimension of time. And these, these uh, representations include the full environment. So that's the land and ocean surfaces and subsurfaces, the full three-dimensional atmosphere from the surface all the way to the top of the atmosphere, as well as the polar ice sheets. Um, similar to the models, weather models that were used to predict the weather every day, climate models are predicting future climate conditions. And they're doing that with three basic equations of physics that are used to kind of forecast or move forward in time um, this global environment. And those are equations of heat, moisture, and motion or momentum. And those equations have been computerized to step forward in time and make a forward prediction of how that environment will evolve over time. The real power of these numerical modeling applications, whether it be weather models or climate models, is in their ability to what we call spin up a reasonable initial condition. And as long as that initial condition is plausible, is something that we could observe, and it's whether it's actually been observed or if it's a hypothetical or what we call a what if scenario, we can use that simulation to better understand how the environment's internal links such as the link between ocean temperatures and hurricane development or wildfire um, will relate and, and may change going forward as climate changes. Um, climate models can be used to do a variety of things. The most obvious that people think of all the time is this kind of forward stepping, look at, looking at a future climate, but they can also be used to reconstruct past climate. And that's very useful because we can actually observe and kind of validate on past climate. And in doing so, we can understand the sensitivities of our past and current climate to what's already been observed. So very technical, obviously, um, and something that I know you spend your, your full-time job thinking about, Pete. Um, maybe Frank, from your side, you could explain how the output of these climate models is important for your decision-making at ELIS. Absolutely, yeah, and, and this, this climate change and, and this sort of overlay Pete's talking about, this goes back to the original need for cat modeling as opposed to actuarial, right? So we obviously use cat models because we're looking at risk from perils that are low frequency and high severity. So if we had millions of data points like life insurance or auto claims, we could rely on more standard actuarial methods. But our job in the property cat market is to deal with the question of what about those things we either haven't seen or perhaps have seen, but are not representative of the long term. So, you know, take for example the risk of a Cat Five hitting Boston or, or north of Boston into Maine. You know, we've not seen this in the historical record, but it's relatively short. So, does that mean we should assume the probability is zero? No, we have to look and see what is meteorologically tenable by forcing these physical conditions the way Pete talks about. So, when we think about climate change, the critical part is are the initial conditions different than we've thought historically? And do we need to force them to create different outcomes than we've been seeing in the past, you know, using only a hindcast model? So for example, in a condition like we have today with warmer sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic, which is observable, um, you know, these are the conditions we've been in since 1995. So it's important to make sure when you model this out, 
you look at a warmer sea surface temperature condition catalog. You know, the previous 30 years for before 1995 were a cooler phase. So while we can learn a lot from them about the, the types of events that happen, we really should be conditioning more with the recent data as well as the last warm period, which was from the 30s to the mid 60s. So by varying the assumptions in our model to look more like the conditions we expect in the near term, next year, two or three years, we get a better outcome, a better representation of what could happen over the next few years. So kind of spinning back to decision making, you know, that helps us focus on risk selection, pricing, portfolio management, by having models that provide a broad spectrum of physically viable scenarios that can let us all look at all the potential outcomes for both the individual positions in the portfolio, things like regionality, is Louisiana getting worse and the Northeast getting better? Should we shift, should we tilt? Should we continue to write the same long portfolio, but uh, short more positions, have more ILWs and hedges where perhaps other people aren't taking these things into account? So you know, our job is to create a, a, a risk return profile for our investors that we think is, is reasonable and they want to invest in and reflective of, of what's actually going to happen in the near term, the next two, three, four, five year horizon that we hope they may invest with us. Thank you, Frank. So th that's a really good overview between the two of you, sort of the importance of modeling and especially these new climate models and how that factors into portfolio selection and, and elements of the job like that in the ILS market. But Pete, turning back to you, we're seeing a lot of technical advancements in modeling generally and, and in technology use across the industry. And climate models are really relatively new still in a lot of cases, but are you seeing improvements in their ease of use and accuracy? Um, and do you expect their uptake to, to continue to increase across the sector? Yeah, good. The, um, the catastrophe models that Frank referred to, which can be plugged into, to some extent, these climate models have been around for decades. Uh, in fact, climate and weather models, which I mentioned earlier, kind of built on the same set of equations, They've been around since the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, they've come a long way, really dramatic improvements over that time. The early, just give you an example of kind of the, um, that advancement. The very earliest climate models took about 20 minutes to step forward in time one day. So taking the kind of full global environment, this gridded representation and moving it forward by 24 hours took about 20 minutes of computing time back in the 1960s. And that was actually only to move forward the ocean surface not and, and the ocean depths, not the atmospheric component. So it would take about 40 minutes to do both. Today, that same calculation moving forward one day can be done in one one hundredth of a second. So just give, give you a sense of the, of the improvement. Now that advance is coming obviously through modern computing technology, high performance supercomputers, that can be networked to do that job of calculating billions of um, equations uh, can be done very, very quickly. Um, so that's kind of the computing aspect, but there are other improvements in the models themselves. And one of those is what we call um, replacing parameterization schemes with explicit physics. So let me explain what I mean by that. There are many processes that we're simulating within that environment of the ocean, the land surfaces, and the three-dimensional atmosphere. And an example of that would be cloud microphysics. So how do clouds develop? How do the cloud droplets develop into a cloud? How does the cloud then develop rainfall that falls out of that cloud and can produce flooding or can produce uh, significant impacts on the surface? That is a very complex process that takes place at a very, very fine scale, the scale of individual cloud drops and raindrops. Whereas we're trying to simulate the large scale global environment, which is obviously very large scale. So that's a challenge in a model. And the way that we tackle that is to try to simplify that process. So the microphysics process of how clouds form traditionally in the very first models was very simply modeled with a very simple equation. Today, we can actually improve that by replacing that quote parameterization with explicit representation of the physics of how the clouds actually form. And in doing so, we get much higher accuracy in the representation of those clouds and the precipitation in the models. That's one example. Another example is what we call boundary layer physics, which is 
the surface layer of the atmosphere, which is where we all live. That's where buildings are. And that's where buildings, property, and life can be at risk from um, these perils. In the very first modeling, um, boundary layer was modeled at what's called the bulk level, meaning very, very large scale, very simple equation for how that uh, very low layer of the atmosphere evolves. Today, we actually model it explicitly. So we're looking at exactly how does that layer um, change in terms of the winds that occur there, how the temperatures change over the course of the day. And all of that is kind of fed into a very fine scale simulation within the larger simulation of the environment. So those are a couple of examples how the models themselves have improved. Then the last comment I'll make here is um, there are other technologies that are coming from other fields that we can also employ in climate modeling. And one that people may have heard of is artificial intelligence and machine learning, AIML, which is um, in essence a model that uses the power of pattern recognition rather than physics to understand how systems operate. And one of those very complex systems that we can gain that advantage is the atmospheric and the ocean systems or the environmental system. So AI ML applications are actually coming into play and in developing a whole new breed of models that are building on the work that's already been done with traditional climate models. And that, that has quite a bit of promise for really, again, better understanding the risk. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd be interested to know, just as a quick follow on question, do you think um, the future of sort of models for the built environment are also going to become very useful in the sector as well? If you can find ways to, to sort of dovetail the outputs of your climate or catastrophe models with true models of real representations of built environment, is that going to help in forecasting potential losses and, and obviously forecasting your exposure in certain regions as well? Yeah, great question. That's um, actually being done already, I guess, in two categories. One would be that the built up environment actually imparts a level of friction on mm -hmm. the winds. So when we think about hurricanes, for example, as hurricanes make landfall, they're actually feeling the effect of the surface uh, over a built up environment like the city of Miami, which has lots of large buildings that are kind of impeding that hurricane from moving inland versus a very smooth environment, say south of Miami, where the surface is very smooth and moist, like a swampy surface. Um, and that's actually a part of the models, not only the climate models, but the catastrophe models that Frank was referring to, which is kind of part and parcel of our business. Then there would be a second category, which is representat representation of individual buildings within a climate model or a weather model. And that can be done um, by sort of building in an engineering sub-model that looks at how a building responds to winds, to temperature changes, uh, how the surface concrete uh, foundation may respond to flooding so, and so forth. And those, um, those improvements are also being made. So that's definitely an area uh, for further improvement, but it's something that's being done and very important aspect of the, of the modeling. Great, thank you, Pete. That's really interesting. It's great to hear how it's advancing. Um, now, when it comes to loss events and the influence of climate change on them, um, Frank, how does climate relate to insured perils and, and what can these models tell you about what to expect across the portfolios of risk that you're building at ELIS? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The climate change clearly, you know, is, is, is linked, you know, to Atlantic hurricane activity, which is the most important peril, uh, obviously. Um, you know, we look at it across all perils. I'll, I'll probably touch on that a bit more later on. But, you know, it, it goes with the overall idea of the model's job is to generate realistic events. Um, so, you know, whether that's 10,000 in a typical model, 100,000 or a million. What, what we're trying to work towards uh, with the ELIS research a bit is, selecting from that span of reasonable hurricanes that could happen, the subset or the tilt, so to speak, that is being influenced in the next couple of years. So for example, uh, as I mentioned before, those periods of history of warm and cool, it doesn't mean those hurricanes in those years were, are unrealistic for today. It just means maybe they're less likely to happen and we, we scale them down. Maybe it's a regional shift. Maybe it's a shift as we sort of describe it as in the histogram of, hur of hurricanes, meaning, um, you know, what's the, uh, the frequency of cat one, two, three, four, and five? Is there a slight shift? 
in some of those in slightly warmer sea surface temperature conditions or cooler conditions. So for us, it's very important to have the large set, but then what we wanna do as a, as a risk manager, build on the base of the models that are very good at producing these realistic type events and, and skew them so that out of the 10,000 year or 100,000 year simulation, we subselect or favor some of them a bit more or less. So, you know, the, the key though over time is balancing recency bias and, and overreaction to any one event or year to ensuring we're incorporating, you know, the latest data in science. Because, you know, we don't want to snap and, and have too much conservatism. Um, and we can't do the other side, which, which people sort of don't talk about. It would be charging zero, right? Um, you know, there's been, European wind has been light since, 2007 with Kirill. Um, you know, so again, you could easily snap the other way and say, all these models are dramatically too conservative. So we're clearly charging too much. Um, but what happens is then you have years like 2018 and 2019 with um, some uh, Japanese typhoon events, which we hadn't seen in years. And we're right back to the mean uh, of what we would expect over a 20, 30 year period. So um, the critical key for us though is, is on climate change. Are the underlying conditions moving? Are they shifting even subtly enough that we don't want to wake up five years from now and say, oh, we missed it, we've got it now. Because no investor likes to hear that, they're sick of hearing, we have it figured out after the event, they want it figured out before the events happen. Right? So, um, you know, from our perspective, this is key on every peril. You should stress test scenarios, see what happens if you're 10% worse or better either way on earthquakes, hurricanes, and severe storms. So, you know, we think that, you know, our investment in models and, and in-house research with, with Dr. Daly is, you know, going to give us a competitive advantage in the space in, in building a long portfolio and a short portfolio and giving our investors really a realistic picture, not of any one year, because it's a matter of process versus outcome, right? We can't promise a certain outcome, but if we have the right process, you know, over time, you should reflect back to what we, we say the picture of risk is over a three to five to 10 year period. Yeah, no, and it's it's becoming increasingly important for investment managers to have their own view of risk in this way and to put the time and energy into into the research that's required to have that. And I think investors are going to start to look for sort of alpha out of those investment decisions that research and science is informing um, going forwards. Um, Pete, turning back to you, um, from your sort of understanding, and this is something that investors would often ask, what, what do you feel the current limitations of the available climate models are? And, and what are the major sources of uncertainty that you see within them? Right. Well, when we talk about uncertainty and modeling, what we're really referring to is what kind of confidence can we put in the in the output of those models? Um, so the first thing I would say is it's really important to point out that there's no easy way to measure the skill or that accuracy of a future climate projection, especially out 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and that's because we haven't lived those climates yet. And so we have to wait quite a long time before we know what's the accuracy of these long range forward looking projections. Um, this also stresses the importance of making these continuous improvements I referred to earlier in increasing the resolution of the models, increasing the um, ability to model these fine scale processes as best we possibly can, and then tracking the performance, even if it is over a short time of a year or two years or five years. Um, so that helps. The good news is that we can track the performance of these climate models by reconstructing past climates and then validating how well has the model been able to um, simulate what we've already observed. And as I referred to earlier, that's one of the, the huge powers that we see in, in modeling is in reconstructing the past and understanding the sensitivity of past climate to changes in temperature and changes in moisture and precipitation. Um, so that, those are kind of two approaches that, that help. Um, now, this means when I talk about reconstructing past climate, means that we can initialize the model with a condition from the past. So we can initialize the model with, say, the conditions of 1900 and move it forward 100 years to the year 2000, and then look and compare that to what we actually have observed. And in doing so, we have to keep in mind that observations from the 19, early 1900s, um, even up to 1940s and 50s, are less confident than observations from the very recent past. So we have to keep that in mind as well. And 
when we do so, um, the observations we have from, say, the 1950s and forward, we can have very high confidence in because that was the time of the advent of remote sensing. So that's when uh, technologies such as satellite and radar observation came into play, and that really added to the fidelity of those observations. We have high confidence in models that can do a good job of simulating post-1950 climate. Uh, a couple more uh, observations I'd make is we have um, the ability to really look at the climate model output by individual peril that we're interested in here at ELIS. And so in doing so, we're looking at quite a wide range of uh, scale. So when I talk about perils, I'm talking about storm surge that can occur, occur along the coastline that's influenced by sea level rise. I'm talking about winds from hurricanes and winter storms, um, wildfires, flooding. So there's a really wide range and those perils occur at a wide range of scale. So an, an easy way to kind of relate the scale to confidence or certainty would be by understanding that climate models are running at a very large scale. And so they're gonna have the best ability in terms of accuracy to simulate large scale perils. The most obvious of these is sea level rise. Sea level rise is occurring globally. We can actually observe this year over year that there's a very small but incremental increase in sea levels. And there's a very obvious physical reason for that. As, the, as you warm up the oceans, they will by definition expand in volume. The oceans can't go down through the ocean surface. They can't go sort of sideways through the land surface. So they can only go one direction and that's up and that's what we call sea level rise. So the good news is that climate models do a very good job modeling sea level rise because it's a large scale phenomenon, but we can also validate that and have high confidence because we actually measure this year over year. Now contrast that with a very small scale peril such as a tornado. Very fine scale occurs in a sort of a short distance of space, but also a, a short period of time. And so climate models will have a much tougher handle on how tornado frequency and severity may respond to say a global change in temperature. Uh, we can observe though, whether those conditions have changed. Um, that's also more challenging because tornadoes are more difficult to observe indi individually than say sea level rise over an expansive ocean. So using that kind of contrast of fine scale and large scale, it gives us a handle on what should we expect from a climate model in terms of its accuracy. Uh, so the, the kind of the key takeaway here is that climate models, as I mentioned earlier, can project forward in time, difficult to validate because we haven't lived that climate yet. They can reconstruct the past. We have to be careful to, um, to measure that uh, confidence depending on the confidence we have in the observations of the past. But what the climate models do the best job of is simulating the current climate and the near future climate. So sort of what's happened this season, what do we expect to happen next season? And the good news there is that that's really the gist of ELIS's business and application of climate models is what is the current risk in the current climate and what do we expect in the near future? What do we expect next? hurricane season, next winter storm season. Um, so that's kind of giving you a sense of the, the range of confidence and what we really focus on here at ELOS. Great, thank you, Pete. And that obviously, as you say, fits in really well with the, uh, the sort of business model of somebody like ELOS who's writing contracts on a sort of one to three year basis, I assume. Um, those models seem to seem to fit with that sort of time scale. Um, Frank, perhaps moving on from that, you could talk a little bit about how ELIS is actually sort of integrating climate model results into your decision making and portfolio selection decisions. Sure. Yeah. I mean, obviously, at ELIS, you know, independent research and, and understanding the vendor models and, and what you need to do to overlay on top of them to write business uh, year to year has, has always been a critical component for our franchise. So, you know, we look at the base models as a starting point and then we build our own overlays. Uh, on top of that, as well as new models for other regions and perils around the world. Um, and as Pete points out, you know, our main focus is ensuring that we're pricing the current near term. 
whether you call it a year or three to five years. Um, we want to make sure we're accurate there because that's critical to our business right now and the positions we're writing. But at the same time, we do recognize the importance of, of investigating how the business could change over time. So, you know, like many others, we're looking at IPCC projections out to 2050, seeing what things could change and stress testing our portfolio against future states. But one interesting thing about all of those that I've, I've found is we also need to incorporate into those studies that, uh, which I've seen absent in all of them, that other things will change commensurate with this. So if we say there's going to be you know, 2%, two degrees warmer temperature, um, pricing will go up because we're not going to continue having hurricanes and, and the reinsurance uh, industry will rebound and, and so will insurance. I mean, look at the period from 17 to 2021. We've had multiple years of compounding rate increases. So, um, you know, the question of are we being compensated for the risk, which is obviously the key question, um, and does the market respond? It clearly has. The market is pricing different than it was five years ago. Um, so, you know, the other key thing that will change is building and construction habits, right? Building vulnerability will certainly change. You know, construction methods and building codes will get, you know, will change. Building codes for sure for health, um, you know, and safety, obviously, issues. Um, but secondarily, construction will have to improve so people can afford insurance. You know, you, you, the, the cost of the home will go up, but the insurance could go down if it's hardened in the correct way. I mean, if you look at areas like Bermuda, where I live here, Okinawa, places like that, they've been hit by hurricanes for years. But the construction practices, you know, the homes that are, are, are you, know, um, uh, you know, built construction, masonry, you know, uh, reinforced kind of concrete, survive very well. So again, if, if Louisiana continues to get hit and, and Florida continues to get hit, we're going to see building code practice changes like we did after Andrew and like we did after the you know, 2003, 2004 season. So um, you know, all those things need to be incorporated. Uh, and I think that's one unfortunate part that hasn't been put in a lot of these studies. But back, back to the present, you know, in our decision-making day-to-day, you know, we look at, as, as Pete said, almost in the same way of fine scale versus large scale, which perils react the most quickly and which ones do I have the most variability? So for example, uh, a risk like US wildfire, West Coast wildfire, we think that that can change more rapidly than hurricane risk. Hurricane risk you know, uh, is a larger global scale type of thing. You know, we're gonna, we always tweak our models for it, but we're probably not gonna dramatically change the expected loss or the, or the 90th and 99th percentile of our models year to year. We'll do incremental you know, changes as we see fit. Something like wildfire, we could be double one year to the next, or, or particularly over a three or five year period because of the conditions of drought, because of the conditions of vegetation and so on. So we're gonna, you know, we keep an eye on all the perils uh, very closely and we swing and shift in terms of what we wanna write and what we wanna uh, protect against, uh, you know, based on the time scale that, that you know, we get feedback from Pete on, you know, how they'll be influenced by the current climate and if there might be a swing back the other way to make it more attractive to write the risk. So decision-making wise, it's, it's, a, it's an incremental every year, relook, improve your models, but there may be areas of fine scale where we really either dive in or we back off year to year because of uh, what we're seeing out there in the, you know, in the current climate conditions. Yeah, it's really interesting how many different factors go into this um, and, and how that can change from year to year as well. And, um, Pete, when your team analyzes sort of new opportunities for underwriting at ELIS, how how critical do you feel it is that climate is properly factored into this nowadays? Well, it's becoming more and more critical every day. I mean, a day does not go by where I don't see an article or uh, some exchange with a colleague on the topic of climate change. So it's obviously there. I've been in the industry for 20 years now, and I can think back to my earliest days where climate change was still discussed back then. So the insurance and reinsurance industry are really on the leading edge of understanding climate change risk. It's nothing new to us. Um, what I've talked about earlier, we, I guess we can categorize in the, in the area of climate change analytics, but I should mention that climate analytics has been a fundamental part of risk management for those 20 plus years that, that I've been in the industry. Um, so it's becoming a, a kind of an additional layer on top of what we already understand and what we're trying to, to, um, to optimize as a part of a, I guess, holistic approach to risk management. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, we consider the past and the future, but most importantly, we consider the present and how the current climate regime may affect the risk 
in the coming year and years. Um, the sensitivities of those perils to changes in temperature, which is kind of the driving factor or fuel for changes in climate overall, is really where we focus our attention in terms of that climate change analytics uh, program. Now, I should mention a few other things. One is that we support original research. One of my jobs here at ELIS is to, is to lead that. And that means both internal original research and collaboration with outside institutions. Um, and that, that really helps us as a kind of collaborative approach to better understand the connections between what the scientific community is looking at, which may be purely scientific, uh, looking at temperatures and changes in moisture and um, changes in, in the um, kind of factors that come together for apparel and what we look at, which is that peril in its most extreme form. So extreme wildfires and extreme or very intense hurricanes and so forth. Um, so that kind of collaboration approach is really kind of marrying the best of the best worlds. Um, we also actively develop innovative applications of climate on a seasonal and multi-season timescale. And the purpose there is to extract material impacts on the risk, something that's really going to matter in terms of our decision making. And um, in fact, it's my main responsibility at ELIS to lead that effort and to feed those innovations back into the, the risk management uh, profile and the risk management process and decision making internally. Um, so let me give you one example. Um, we consider, and Frank's mentioned a couple of times, the connections between hurricane risk on a seasonal basis and um, the connections to climate. Now, the most obvious connection there would be to the Atlantic Ocean. This is where hurricanes form. And you expect that as the Atlantic Ocean warms up that there's more fuel for hurricanes to develop. So that's one thing we need to focus very tightly on. There's quite a bit of research in that area and the climate models have been simulating those effects for quite some time. So that's something we have sort of a body of research to build on. Now let's break the problem into components. That's the most obvious kind of local component, the Atlantic Ocean, but there's also a relationship to the Pacific Ocean. There's an oscillation that occurs there known as ENSO, which is the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or what people may have heard, the El Nino La Nina cycle. And that's happening in the Pacific Ocean, very far from the Atlantic. But there's a connection to the Atlantic known as a teleconnection, which is a very far field connection, but a well known and proven physical relationship. What happens is when the Pacific Ocean warms in what we call El Nino condition, it increases the amount of wind shear in the Atlantic Ocean. And during hurricane season, that can actually break down hurricanes and cause them to dissipate or not allow them to intensify. So a warming of the Pacific is actually sort of detrimental to hurricanes, but a warming of the Atlantic is actually a factor that can increase hurricane frequency and intensity. Those are counteracting effects or what we call a feedback effect. And so we need to understand both if we're gonna get a handle on how warming is going to impact hurricane risk. Um, we can continue to peel that onion. So it's not just those two factors, but now we have to look at, well, how do those effects impact the counts of tropical storms, hurricanes, major hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean? How will that affect landfall and the ability of those storms to actually produce damage over land? How will it affect the wind field? How will it affect the precipitation field, which lends itself to flooding? How will it affect ocean surfaces and impact storm surge along the coast? So there's so many factors that we're already kind of taking a close look at. And here we consider, OK, how will climate change and these near field and far field impacts affect the overall risk? So it's quite a complex problem, but it's not a problem that's new to us. It's something that we've been doing for quite some time. Um, the last comment I'll make is that in terms of risk management, um, this holistic approach is already set us apart in the industry. And um, you know, with so much attention, as you said, on climate change every day, we're putting our foot on the gas pedal and we're really picking up the pace on um, doing this innovative research, applying it to risk management. And that's not only to continue differentiation uh, in the industry, 
but ultimately it's to bring solid returns to our investors. Mm. Well, that's fascinating. It's really incredible how sophisticated the models have become in the last two decades, as you said, in the time you've been in the industry and I'm similar, similar amount of time myself and really, really fantastic to see sort of how much detail is going into trying to understand the perils that um, are being underwritten at this point in time. Um, so Frank, perhaps finally, as we begin to wrap this conversation up, you could maybe talk a little bit about some of the conversations you have with investors on the topic of climate. And maybe also you could give us a few thoughts as for the, the role climate risk modeling might play at this year's renewals as we move towards the end of the year. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as I'm sure you'd expect the topic of climate change, as, as you said at the top of the hour, you know, is front and center with our investors. It, there's no, no conversation that we have that doesn't come up. And generally, the conversations are focused around, you know, a few questions. And, and the first one is, are your models properly capturing the risk of the current and near term climate? Right. And, and obviously, that's a bit obvious, but what's behind that? It means they're kind of asking, you know, twofold. Are they just based on rearward looking stuff and you're just doing some stimulations and, and you know, adding a little bit to the tail and, and not really capturing a changing state? And kind of part two of that is, well, has there been a fundamental shift that requires a new approach and, and not even just a, a, little, uh, a little increase, right? So you know, that, that's obviously critical. I'll, I'll come back to that, that question in a minute. The second, because the first is very much around Atlantic hurricane risk is what we've seen the most of and it's the most costly and it's been a lost driver since 2017. The second most frequent question we get is around secondary perils as they've sort of been dubbed. Um, you know, are they getting worse due to climate change or am I just seeing more of them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, because I'm in this space and I would never, you know, if you weren't an investor in the space, you wouldn't pay attention to severe storm losses uh, or, or wildfire other than what you see on the news. And, and then the third question, which of course ties back to the first, is really the fundamental one. Are we properly, are we getting properly compensated for taking this risk? So even where people get their heads around, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, maybe they believe our models are correct, let's say within 10% either way, they say it's a model, I think it's reasonable, I can see your back testing, but this is a space with highly variable outcomes. So, you know, even if the regional reason, uh, you know, the, the outcomes that you modeled are, are reasonable, how am I sure I'm getting paid for the volatility? And that's, that's more of a portfolio theory question or a comparison to other asset classes question. So, you know, focusing on the, those three, you know, as you said, Steve, we have to spend a lot of time informing our investors about this and, and giving them the data and research to properly evaluate the asset class. We, we certainly don't want to sell, say to anybody, hurricanes don't happen. Don't worry about climate change. That's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to inform them what the risk return profile looks like, just like any other asset class. And then they can make the judgment call of how much to put in and, and how to protect themselves uh, if they do want to invest. So, you know, we have a high commitment to research, as Pete said, which is, you know, wh why we brought him in and, and, and launched the Illus Research Institute. You know, and, and Pete, you know, you sort of mentioned, you know, a lot's happened in the last 20 years. He's pretty modest, you know, a lot of that is because of him. He, he was the first architect of the warm sea surface temperature catalog at AIR. You know, side, side story, but Pete and I worked together there. And after Hurricane Katrina, where I was wandering around in a hard hat three days after in Biloxi, Mississippi, with a with a clipboard uh, in Gulfport, you know, analyzing how much uh, you know damage to the roofs there was, and then feeding it back to the model, we all sat a bit dumbfounded in Karen Clark's you know office and in AIR in Boston. We said, "Are we missing something?" And, and that's when Pete and the, and the the researchers there said, "I think we might be." You know, we're we're by that, at that point, we we're only 10 years into this warmer sea surface temperature regime. And they said, yeah, I think we need to condition these catalogs. And, and again, as Pete mentioned, this is something we've been looking at for a long time. So it's not new to us. It's just a matter of making sure we're keeping up to date with it. So, um, you know, for us as kind of longtime professionals in the space, you know, we do have the perspective of seeing some of this play out before, particularly after 04 and 05. So, you know, really without giving away too much of our proprietary work, you know, we address these questions with our investors, showing them that, you know, if you actually look at this most current period since 1995, the models are actually running uh, or observed is actually running reasonably well within expectations. You know, there's a massive recency bias for all of us that we've all forgotten the period of 06 to, to 2016. They, of course, now have to ask the questions, are, is there some serial correlation? Are we going to have feast or famine periods? 
Uh, is there some memory in the system that, that we're gonna have two bad years and then two good years? The, the, those are all things that have to be part of the research and not that they're all uh, singular independent um, uh, type of years. So, you know, again, our job is to give them all that information and try to get as much as we can um, a real perspective of the risks so they can make good decisions. Um, on the secondary perils, you know, we also spend a lot of time on those because they really can eat you up, death by a thousand cuts. And, you know, we try to control them one through the, uh, the, the modeling and, and, you know, forcing our models to push us away from things we don't want to write. But they actually can be often much better controlled through underwriting structuring and, you know, uh, different structural features in our, in, our, um, in our contracts that cap those or drive them out through higher deductibles and so on. So that can be done from a portfolio management perspective as well as uh, from a science perspective. So, you know, in the end, the whole, our job is to inform our investors, you know, they're looking for this uncorrelated investment, you know, that this can still be a profitable asset class with a good risk reward profile. So, you know, they're ultimately our partners and, you know, our research and investment in the models is, is going to be a key component of their decision-making process. And in any industry like ours, no different, we got to constantly challenge our assumptions and try to improve the product. So obviously the impact of climate change is, is front and center and, and, and obviously a key area of research. And, and that's why we're doing a lot on it, as Pete said, the independent research, um, we have a climate change research series that we share with our partners and investors. Uh, we're about to release the, the second in that series focused on Atlantic hurricane. And finally, Pete's gonna take a lot, he's presently working on you know, the extension of the original warm sea surface temperature condition catalog so that ELIS, we can have an even more refined vision uh, incorporating the best research in the last five years. So this is a bit, 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 bit of a long winding answer, but you know, those are the key questions people ask. Our job is to sort of calm them on recency bias and say, yes, this, this has happened, but it's in the realm of expectations. It's not a one in a thousand in the model. It's clearly in the model, um, you know, but it's also it doesn't mean this is going to happen every year and it is a space you should stick with. So um, that, that's, that's the key for us is making sure that, um, you know, the, the most recent uh, information, which always gets us, uh, uh, isn't overplayed. And, and just as a sort of follow on to that, you cannot as an underwriter or a risk manager adjust your models based on the market conditions of pricing, basically. What I mean by that is we had the reverse going on in 14, 15, 16, 17, really in 16 into 17, where there were papers out and you can look them up by very key pay, uh, researchers like Bill Klotzbach at CSU saying, is the Atlantic active hurricane era at its end? There was a lot of postulation that we were leaving this warmer sea surface temperature because we had 10 year drought. And a lot of people in our industry, not to point fingers, but actually stopped using the warmer sea surface temperature catalogs. They said, clearly we're coming out of this. It's been 10 years of no storms. You know, Maybe we've been over baking the model. We didn't believe the physical conditions had changed. So we, we kept that way. But you know, as an industry, you have to be very careful not to adjust your risk models to fit what's going on in the supply demand metric and you know, lower, basically lower things because you're not getting paid as much. You should just you know, fess up and say, it's not as good right now and here's the returns in this present market. So uh, yeah, a little bit of a longer answer maybe than you're looking for, but that, that's what's critical to us. And that's what we tell back to, you know, feed back to our investors that you know, stick with us through the good times and the bad. Yeah, no, that, that's really interesting. I mean, it really is all about um, making making bold decisions, but also sensible decisions with the best information and research you can possibly have behind you as well. Um, so very interesting discussion, gentlemen. Thank you very much. That was a great insight into your work at ELIS and the way you're in integrating climate modeling within your decision making as well. So I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Frank. Um, great to see you both and hope to talk to you both soon. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve.